Hello, this is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com. I want to talk about Dvorak's humoresques and their influence and relationship to American popular music. Now, this is a topic that sort of fascinates me ever since I read quite a marvelous book by conductor uh, Maurice Perez. Here it is, Dvorak to Duke Ellington. A conductor explores America's music and its African-American roots. This is an absolutely splendid book on the musical culture at the time that Dvorak came to the USA uh, and taught at the National Conservatory in New York in the early 1890s, 1892, 93, 94, in that area. And the fabulous mixture and blending of musical influences that that affected Dvorak and which he in turn affected. Exactly how this back and forth happened, it's really impossible to tell. Of course, we don't know unless we actually talk to somebody and were there exactly what he heard, how he reacted to it, and the result. But we do know what he composed. We don't know necessarily what he thought. And the eight humoresques for piano, I, you know, they're these delicious little pieces. And as you know, number seven is probably one of the most popular little beginning piano pieces after Beethoven's for Elisa. And everyone plays it, but I, nobody thinks about these pieces. And they're wonderful. They're absolutely wonderful. I have a couple samples that I want to play for you. They're taken from this excellent super fun set of the uh, complete Dvorak piano music played by Radoslav Kvapil. Now, of course, Dvorak is not known as a composer for the keyboard in any way, shape, or form. You know, his piano concerto got rewritten, wrongly, I think, and unnecessarily, and his solo piano works never get performed. I mean, nobody plays them, except for maybe the seventh humoresque, that little two and a half minutes. And Let's start there. I just want to talk about a couple of them and give you just an idea of what I'm thinking about because the humoresques, which were composed in 1894, are in some way sort of a microcosm of the cultural ferment that Dvorak encountered in New York and all of the influences on him. One of the fascinating things about these pieces is that Dvorak originally thought of calling them Scottish dances, which is bizarre, I think and probably why he didn't call them that. And, you know, ultimately he did write a set of Scottish dances for piano, by the way, but he dropped, he dropped the term. But it goes to show that he was thinking, he was thinking in his mind about certain elements of ethnic music when he wrote them. And I think probably the reason he wound up with humoresques is because there are so many different small little influences and nuances that you can hear in these charming little pieces but th that come from everywhere. And he's just taken them all and synthesized them into an absolutely marvelous and somehow dvorak and unique and not terribly eclectic sounding, but a remarkable idiom. I mean, they don't sound patchy. You don't, they don't sound like they're taking something from here and there, but I, when I say eclectic in that way, but in another way, they are eclectic because you hear the nascent style of American music. You hear jazz, you hear ragtime, you hear the things that African-American composers who Dvorak knew and who he taught at the National Conservatory, you know, the things that were going on in contemporary popular music and musical styles that Dvorak would have regarded as ethnic or nationalistic. So listen to this little bit, just this little tiny phrase from the fifth humoresque. Now listen, listen to that final cadence, that marvelous final cadence. Doesn't it sound a little bit like this something or other, this little bit? Yeah, that's, that's the blues tune from Gershwin's An American in Paris that was written a couple of decades later. And you can really hear how you know, Dvorak is, is, is taking what would later become basically a cliche 
of popular music style and incorporating it into the sound of, of his is the harmonic scheme of his seventh humoresque. I, I wonder how many people play it and even notice you know what's happening there. Or or listen to this bit from the fourth humoresque. I made a little bit of a sort of montage to really cut out a repetition and, and let you hear the two the two basic melodic ideas in it, which are which are splendid and wonderful. The first sounds like 50s lounge music and the second is it could be a popular song. It could be Harry Warren's Jeepers Creepers. In fact, I'm putting the link of the uh, YouTube, the YouTube version of the original recording of that sung by the, the marvelous, marvelous singer Ethel Waters in 1938. So you can hear. I mean, that that's the tune that Dvorak has basically in the fourth humoresque. It's Jeepers Creepers, where'd you get those peepers? But on the other hand, it's also the same tune that you find in the, in the Slavonic dance, you know, Opus 72, number five. Listen to this. Is it Czech? Is it American popular music? Is it a Tin Pan Alley song? There's no question that with Dvorak, he invariably uh, wrote his own original material. I mean, there are instances where he borrowed a tune for a particular purpose, like in the overture My Home, where he takes a, a Czech popular song and incorporates it into the overture. Those are special cases. Most of the time, all of the material is original because he had such a fund of melody, he didn't need to borrow anything from anybody and he could create his own tunes in any style he wanted. And that's the point. He would adopt a harmonic idiom, a rhythmic trick. That's where he got the idea of Scottish folk dances, you know, from that famous Scotch snap, that da-da, da-da, that kind of rhythm. You know, those are the things that, you know, constituted the sort of ethnic music that Dvorak would imitate now and again. And in his American pieces, there's been, of course, uh, controversy since the day he wrote them about whether it's American, American Indian music, Native American music, or African American music, and how much of it, and whether he learned it from his students at the National Conservatory, and then, of course, what they learned from him. And we're going to talk about some of these things in a future video, too, because I just find the topic fascinating. It's a wonderful example of what happened and what could happen in the days before, you know, political correctness and the idea of cultural appropriation, when when everything was there for the taking and everybody was trying everything. They were people were just using whatever whatever musical materials existed at the time to create what they hoped would be great music. And and I think it's a, a wonderfully important lesson for us in you know the ability of people to learn from each other and to get along and to create great great works of art from the materials that they're finding around them in their normal daily experience of music you remember also at the national conservatory that dvorak taught with uh, Ruben goldmark who was an american composer who was the nephew of carl goldmark and Ruben goldmark taught people like gershwin and and Aaron Copeland and and so you know these these lines of influence we can't overestimate what they were because first of all you can't ever second judge a genius you don't know where people got what they got and what they did with it and what they were thinking when they did whatever they did with it and so we have to be a little bit careful 
But we, what we can say is that these things were there. They were there for the taking and great composers and great artists made great music out of them. So I would really strongly recommend that you give a second listen to Dvorak's innocent little humoresques, these charming little piano works that, and ask yourself, what are they? Are they incipient ragtime? Are they jazz? Are they lounge music? Are they Czech? Are they Scottish? I mean, how much fabulous, suggestive music can this great composer pack into this tiny, tiny little space in the matter of, you know, in the matter of just a, just a few seconds worth of music. He can transport us from one world to another, all in a completely seamless and harmonious way. It's a gift, folks. There's no question about it. So that's, that's my thinking uh, for this little chat about Dvorak and his humoresques of 1894. I hope this has given you something to think about as well and uh, that you enjoy listening to them and and uh, that it gives you some, you know, reason to keep on listening, which is why we're all here, isn't it? Thank you all. Take care.